Hi everyone, welcome to the Adlerian Counseling Lecture, a topic I'm super excited about, so let's jump on in. Okay, so very similar to our psychodynamic uh, video lecture, it can be really helpful not to just understand the history of a theory, but also to get to know the theorists a little bit better. So let's get to know Adler just a little bit better. Adler was born in Vienna, Austria, uh, to a family of six other siblings. Adler's childhood was marked with incredibly poor health. He reported later on in life that he had a very, very frail childhood. Around the ages of four or five, he contracted pneumonia and was incredibly sick, so much so that his parents called the family physician over to the house. Adler shared years later, overhearing a conversation um, between his mother and the doctor, in which the doctor told his mother that Alfred was very lost. Other salient points in his uh, life, uh, or childhood experience, is that because of this childhood frailty, he was really, really shy and kind of bashful. In his education, he was often poked fun at because of this. There was a moment that he remembered in which all of the smartest people in his class uh, couldn't answer a question his teacher had asked them. Uh, one, you know, one person would try, another person would try, but no one got it right. I remembered at this moment raising his head and he answer the question and being laughed at by the other children uh, because he was often so shy and bashful. In this moment, though, he got, he got the answer right, something that stuck with him for years later. Another final really salient point in his childhood was that he had, uh, as he reported later on in life, a really strong relationship with his father, yet really strived to uh, have a stronger relationship with his mother, while his older brother had a really uh, developed relationship with his mom. Uh, this, this inferiority, this, this frustration of not having uh, such a strong relationship that his brother did really was a sibling rivalry moment. Um, Adler reported that these really, these early life experiences were major factors in his life design that later design, uh, later encouraged him to becoming a physician. As we move from his childhood into his adulthood and professional career, uh, as a physician, he later studied underneath Freud and was a key member of the Vienna Psychodynamic Society. He was there for nearly a decade. As the time uh, went on, he was seen to be a really critical member. Himself, Freud, and Jung are really foundational members of the society. Now, conflict started to uh, occur when Adler really started to challenge some key tenets of psychodynamic uh, psychology. A key area in which he challenged was he believed that the past mattered and it was not a deterministic factor. What I mean by this is that in psychodynamic, that the past is so important to understand because it impacts and can be a determining factor and often is a determining factor into influences of our life. What Adler said and what he differed was is that the past matters and it's not as deterministic. He was a true believer that individuals are major change agents in their life. He, he noted that the past matters truly only as much as we in the current or the clients in the current believe it matters. Now these views were totally revolutionary and caused a lot of conflict, particularly between Freud and Adler. At one point, Freud even called him a heretic. In around 1911, uh, he was asked um, pretty convincingly to leave the society. He left the society and about a year later, in 1912, he established the Society of Individual Psychology, uh, in which he started uh, Adlerian therapy, as we now call it. Now, it's important to, again, underscore the, the, the importance that Adler was not saying that the past does not matter. Rather, it matters only through our perspective of the current. Um, he believed again, that Adlerian counselors should differ by, instead of being in an expert role, analyzing and diagnosing, rather being in a cooperative and an intentional um, 
relationship with a client. We'll speak more to some of the differences as we continue and some of the major tenets of uh, Adlerian therapy. Now, as we transition from the history into the cornerstones of Adlerian therapy, this can be really helpful in helping to see the difference between psychodynamic as well in the future to float back to as what are some of the factors that help differentiate Adlerian therapy from some of the other theories that we'll learn. A really, really critical lens that Adler had at this point was holding the relationships uh, with community relationships, uh, interpersonal relationships with friends, family, uh, and our greater community are incredibly crucial. Adler hypothesized that we are social creatures and that our interconnectedness uh, really could help be a, a wellness network uh, to improving mental health. He really had an attention to values, beliefs, and goals, and interests, as well as attitudes of his clients. He noted, and this was again a major shift from the society he came from of psychodynamic to what he founded, was that behavior is purposeful and goal-oriented. Rather than being unconscious urges or uh, talking about metaconscious, it said that if we understand the behavior through the lens of someone's goals or their life purpose, we can really start to understand someone holistically. And something that is so critical is that he really wanted to honor that people are holistic beings, that there are systematic processes within each of us that if understood in the individual as well as in the whole, that we can start to understand someone's personality and start to understand how we as clinicians can be helpful in getting them through that stuckness. Now, one of my favorite words and one I really struggle with, phenomenological, there we go, really this subjective reality, the studying that my reality, no matter how similar, if my twin, if my brother, my sister, even if I'm so close to them, my reality is going to be subjective. My The way I see things, the way that things impact me, my goals, values, beliefs, and attitudes will differ. This was so revolutionary in that uh, rather than being impulses that might be very biological and, and deterministic, uh, he saw that we all need to be uh, aware that our journey might look different because our uh, phenomenological reality, our reality itself is different. Pretty dang revolutionary, uh, especially for the time. Huh. Oh, anyways, thanks, Pat Cody. I got it from here. So let's move on when it comes to some key terms around Adler and his viewpoint around personality. So the first two that are really, really uh, foundational and also really well known is the inferiority and superiority feelings. Now, some can have a really strong reaction to this. I know in my master's program, I, I kind of pulled away and I said, uh, I don't know how I feel about this. Really, when we look at it, Adler saying that we have things we're not good at and we have some things that we are good at. And this is can be found across all humans. He believed that these inferiority feelings are really fundamental in helping us in motivation and helping us drive forward. So when we think about a little kid, let's say, gosh, one or two year old, whom is playing with a little block game, the, uh, they grab a, a triangle block and they keep trying to put it into the, the circle and it's just not working. They get really frustrated and we see them, we see them really focused and, and paying attention. And their reaction might differ. Some might get really frustrated and really try to slam it in. Some might get really, really sad and cry and feel upset that they just can't figure out. Others just might remain curious or kind of confused or maybe in the middle of, meh, this is interesting, but just so to keep my attention. Adler would say that all of those make sense and are normal, that the inferiority feeling is really there to help us strive forward uh, in order to help uh, 
move towards our goals and our ideal self. So with that superiority, that superiority is the other side of that is that the things that we are markedly good at, the um, places that make us strive. So the little one of the little kids figures out that they can put it in the circle by turning it. They just figured out how to, how to work it just right. And they, they think, wow, I did it. I'm excited. Um, that or another little kid who figures out, oh, the triangle goes in the triangle block. Um, that both of those could be really key in that guiding self-ideal. That self-ideal is really kind of a script that we all have, uh, as ad believes, we all have that develops us towards our personality, towards our behaviors, our thoughts, our cognitions. That really this develops in a quite strong way as we are in uh, our childhood. That I believe I can, I can't, in certain areas really can change our trajectory. If we think back to Adler himself, that I'm not good in school, that really key fundamental moment that he highlights is that with the time he was successful in spelling something in front of his whole class might have been a really big turning moment for him, uh, helping him to, through that inferiority, build superiority of his skills and maybe even led him to being a doctor. Um, our scripts, too, are something that really we get to see where the shoulds, coulds, musts, have tos might be aligned for us, whereas they might be completely different for a twin, a family member, or a friend. That guiding self ideal also really resonates when it comes to the values uh, and goals that someone has. Um, we'll speak more towards that here in a bit. That self interest, uh, self interest is, or pardon me, social interest is so dang important is that anything and everything we do is interconnected as a relational mark towards others. That Adler believed that if we have less of this, that this is something that can be really concerning, that as a diagnostic criteria, that those that have less self-interest, um, we might need to have some concern around. We might need to say, wow, this, this seems abnormal. This might be abnormal psychology, uh, an abnormal development. So way of helping uh, will be really related to that social interest. We'll talk about that here a little more. In the same vein is community feeling, the sense of interconnectedness with others. It's the, I feel connected even when I might necessarily not be connected with someone. That I can think back and right now think about my rationale, my reasoning for doing, maybe you doing this master's program, me doing this, uh, this PhD program, is that we have interconnected feelings about our community and why our purpose is. Two other really key uh, areas that Adler was critical in developing is this viewpoint of birth order and early recollections. Now, because of the constraints we have for this, and also just the breadth of knowledge that is out there, this video will not do justice specific to this area. I really, really encourage you to, to take a look at this area in more depth. Really what Adler here was saying is that your birth order matters, that while it's not deterministic. It's not that a firstborn always feels this way. It's that these might be really normal viewpoints or really normal um, behaviors if someone is born into whatever their birth order is. Another thing that I really personally appreciate is that he saw a birth order as being something that they can all like that the client can really contribute to. And might be wondering, well, if they were born as firstborn, then how can they contribute to that? I'll use myself as an example. I have a huge Italian family, and I have well over a uh, hundred cousins. It's a big family. I am one of the oldest, uh, oldest of the cousins, and often I identified as being kind of the middle cousin because there were five others ahead of me that I can be in my immediate family, a firstborn, and in my pretty dang immediate family, my larger family, that I might also pull traits as a middle, uh, a middle birth order child. 
Okay, now we float to early recollections. Um, early recollections are really, really powerful when it comes to some of the assessments that Adler proposes we do. That in building, especially in a, when we are building a relationship, that having an understanding of in that moment, how is someone relating back to the past is critically important. That this is a piece of knowledge that the past speaks to the future. So whatever we're carrying in the moment is going to be connected to back then. Um, that early recollections can change, that they don't necessarily have to be foolproof, that it doesn't really matter. It's whatever that person brings up in the moment is something that we can help to, again, that holicism to better understand the person in front of us in that moment. I'd like you to pause the video here and I'd really like to encourage you to, to think about your birth order, to think about your true birth order, as well as when it comes to additional family or when it comes to uh, your larger family or friends, are there other areas do you still identify as a firstborn? Do maybe you kind of identify like me as being a firstborn in your immediate and as a middle child or a youngest or an only? I'd like you to jot this down and then I'd like you to float back to your text, looking over at what some of the text says around being whatever your birth order is. What things resonate? What things land flat? What things do you disagree with? I'd like you to jot these down and think about how this might be useful if working with a client to know these things to help identify and be curious around birth order. Let's talk briefly about what it means in the way of being a Adlerian counselor. So a really core tenant is this cooperative relationship, the viewpoint that the counselor might be the expert in counseling and that the client is an expert of their life and their experience. Um, Adlerians believe that when these two meet, that really amazing progress can happen. And um, on the same vein, they're really strengths and wellness focused. Again, going back to this holistic being um, does not mean they wouldn't look at diagnostic criteria to say, hey, this might be uh, a concern or someone is experiencing this kind of mental illness. Rather, it also says, and this person has strengths. They have things that um, things that are amazing about this person that we can utilize to get them to their goals. Um, they utilize a sense of optimistic empathy. This is not to say that they diminish or they ignore or they kind of just like cheerlead over someone's feelings. It's really sitting with a person and holding this non-judgmental and optimistic sense that this person is capable of all the change that they're looking for and regardless that they are worthy, that they are, uh, they are wonderful as they are. Um, as a person, that behaviors can change and that this person is wonderful. Last part is this viewpoint on social justice. Adler had an amazing viewpoint, uh, especially with the time in which he was developing the theory that uh, social justice matters, that these topics matter, and they impact our clients. A uh, brief example is that back uh, when Adler was developing this, he was a huge uh, advocate of women's rights and women's potential. Uh, he viewed the systemic, um, the systemic ties on women as to blame, rather than the fact that they were less than. So really he was saying that as a society, we don't help women and um, really help them to be their potential, which is just as great as any man's potential. Pretty revolutionary, especially for the time. And that, that social justice sense continues today. So we'd like to introduce you all to my dog, Gouda. Um, she's gonna be helping us as we wrap up our discussions of the way of being uh, as an Adlerian counselor. So from the first picture you see, um, Gouda here is showing how Adlerian counselors need to be adaptable, flexible, and social. That they, in their social relationships with clients, need to be able to really be able to fluctuate, be able to meet the client's need um, as best they're able, to be adaptive, to be able to kind of roll re with resistance, to take a look at things in different ways. Uh, the attention uh, that they have as we continue down the semester, you'll see uh, other theoretical orientations will really focus on one or two of cognitions, of feelings, or body sensations. Whereas at Larian's, it depends on the client. 
um, that the attention can be towards thoughts, feelings, body sensations, all one or two, that Adlerians are comfortable in, in intermixing with all three and see them as important as another. The shifting perspective, um, again, we see on the first picture, Gouda uh, has lost her ball. She's looking for it and she's looking at it kind of a different way. You know, she's just trying to, to see it. And maybe if she, she sticks her butt up in the air, she can see just a little bit more is maybe Gouda's thought. The last two pictures here, that Adlerians are open to this being non-directive and directive, that it's a continuum that if you're a person who finds themselves as being a little more non-directive or a person who is a little more directive, that Adlerian would work. And Adlerian would challenge a counselor who's really non-directive that there are times where being directive would be really necessary. I like to highlight in all counseling and Adlerian especially that directive and non-directive are are not synonymous with being always in charge and not synonymous with just kind of being laid back. That even the most non-directive client, like the second picture on the bottom left of, with Gouda, that she is fully attentful. She's listening, she's curious, and she is engaged. Being 100% engaged, you can be non-directive. Being 100% engaged, you can be more directive. It does not mean uh, phasing out or just kind of sitting there. Ways of understanding as an Adlerian counselor. When it comes to the very first couple sessions and then throughout, uh, many Adlerian counselors will do a lifestyle assessment. Some will do this in a very formal way where they'll have a questionnaire, they might give it to the client, they might discuss it while the counselor fills it out. The counselor might choose to go through the questions um, without it even present and just kind of track things. It really depends on the clinician's uh, preference. Myself, Kind of that middle, uh, really having a conversation, and this doesn't need to be a formal assessment. Rather, we just a conversation. I want to make sure I hear uh, hear each of the points eventually is my style. And Adlerians, if this is something you choose, you can choose your own. This lifestyle assessment really helps to map out what are the inferiority feelings, what are the superiority feelings, what is the guiding self-ideal. The whole assessment is really trying to Understand this this holistic person by taking snapshots and saying, okay, this might be some of the guiding self-ideal. These might be some of the inferiority feelings that might be blocking them and getting to where they want to be. And here's some superiority feelings that we can really uh, help to bolster to getting us to where we need to go. Lifestyle assessment is is not to be judgy. It's not to be critical. It's It's a tool to be able to better understand our clients and for them to increase their self-awareness of themselves. Ways of understanding as well as uh, family consult uh, consultations. Again, back in the day, Adler, Adler was incredibly inventive, and this was something that was huge. Uh, really uh, developed after his time as well as um, that getting perspectives from family members or teachers or trusted adults into the mix might be really important when we're talking about a child or a family unit that's in therapy. Other ways of understanding are going to be the birth order, um, the birth order we've already talked about. Uh, Adlerians are doing assessments uh, continually to better just make sure that they are tracking and, and they are getting to be in the client's shoes as much as possible. All right, as we get to our final slide, this is ways of intervening as an Adlerian counselor. I don't want to say that these are all the ways of intervening. These are really just a highlight of some that I've chosen. Adlerians believe that the interpersonal, the therapeutic relationship is a way of intervening, that um, being able to encourage this additional self-insight is something that's really powerful. That meaning making, that purpose, bringing that to attention for the client for some might be a really powerful intervention. Private logic. Each and every one of us through Adlerian counseling believe that there's a private logic, that we have our way, that we believe the world works. Some of it might be might be capital or uh, small t truth. Um, some of it might be a little distorted. That, that highlighting these times where there is distortion that I'm not good enough at 
stats class when that person gets an A or a B, that highlighting this might be really helpful into understanding and getting clients that next step. The other part is that helping clients design new thinking patterns and uh, behavior patterns. Again, with that private logic, one of the most powerful things is the spitting in someone's soup. It is this viewpoint that um, the counselor might be seeing this reciprocal, this, this continual circular thinking that is not helping the client. So they spit in their soup. They bring this to the attention. They say, you know, I'm curious, how does that help you? They say a client who comes in and says, you know, gosh, no one likes me. What proof is there of that? Help, help me understand. What? How do you know people don't like you? People have said this. They said that directly to you. That challenges that negative, uh, distorted private logic. And that's a way of really powerfully intervening. Again, Adlerians believe that they can be directive to non-directive. So these all these interventions might look slightly different um, and um, can be really, really personalized to that person and should be personalized to that person. The last part when it comes to spitting someone's soup is all the assessments come back into mix here that someone's birth order, if you know, if an Adlerian noticed that um, they were really identifying as an only child and that they um, never want to share because they were never expected to. That would be brought up. That would be brought into light. If someone's guiding ideal or guiding self um, was uh, believed, I always must be the best, then that right there is something that spitting the soup uh, might bring that to light and also challenge how true is that.